Mental health used to be a stigma. There was a stigma against yes, it. Was. You had your crazy uncle that you hid in the cellar and that nobody even knew existed, yes. except they could hear his incoherent screams yes. three houses right. away. Right. It has migrated from what was a stigma to now almost a status symbol. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. so. And I happen to know very well, I'm not going to name precisely who this is, a human being who will turn 16 later this month. Mm. And this human being that I'm not going to identify attends a school, hmm. kind of on the liberal side culturally, in which almost everybody there is wearing a badge of honor. This is my affliction. Yeah. And that's a problem. Because what happens in our Western society at the moment, we are seeing an infantilization of people that should be mature. So you're supposed to be a grown-up by the time you hit your 30s. But we're seeing that a lot of people hitting their 30s, they're still adolescents in an emotional and psychological sense. Mm -hmm. So how do you excuse your lack of growth? You wear the badge of honor. Say, but, but I've got this, I've got this. And now I've got an identity. Because as human beings, we all need to have an identity. But what's an easy identity to take on? Well, sometimes is the badge of honor. And, and this is not only a matter of us as individuals. This is how we relate to other people, how they relate to us. In fact, one of the things I wanted to bring up, which is going to bring us into the work that you do. You guys work with companies, is that correct? Absolutely. Yes. Okay, you work mm -hmm. with companies. I'm going to call companies communities. Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, not all companies feel like communities. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, I've been in companies, yeah. we all have, where the sense of community was not necessarily all that deep. Yes. But one of the things that can help, but a sense of community can help someone with a sense of loneliness. Yes. And there is a lot of literature these days about the so-called loneliness epidemic. In fact, when I read this this morning to prepare yeah. for this, yeah. I really couldn't believe it, but yes. there happened to be it, it's real. in the yeah. New York Times yeah. today mm -hmm. yes. about the epidemic of loneliness and that Great Britain actually has, no joke, a minister for loneliness. <laughs> Uh, did you know this? No, I did not even know. <laughs> I mean, leave it to the Brits. But anyway, yeah. so they are creating all kinds of programs to get people to interact with each other. And I see this as having come from two major areas. Number one, the de-churching of mm -hmm. both societies. Yeah. Number two, the fact that companies, especially during the epidemic when we were socially isolated, mm -hmm. could not deliver as if it was ever their mission, which we could dispute, but could not deliver the sense of community. Would you agree, Amy, Amy, I apologize, that there is an epidemic of loneliness? 100%. I want to add a third piece to that, which is technology. I went into a restaurant yesterday and they sat me down at the table, great, but I had to order with an app. I had to figure out how it took took longer than just someone asking my order, but I had to figure it out, put in my numbers. It asked me if I wanted to tip. I said, well, I've done all the work myself. I don't understand why, what, who am I tipping here? We're Australians. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it really struck me that I haven't had that human contact with, besides the lady walking, there you go, you're on your own, good luck, that was it. You know, I haven't had that connection and we see it all the time. In other words, would you like to tip your tablet? Basically, yeah, that's what it was. I felt like <laughs> so, but it was it just struck me in that moment that absolutely that that's we're creating all these barriers at the same time as saying we need a minister for loneliness because this is a problem. We're also kind of heading off in the other direction as well. And so, this it brings up an interesting issue though, because if we talk about communities and we talk about companies which are you know human beings together. Mm. And you guys work in the communal mental health culture right. of a company. Can you describe what a healthy working environment looks like? Yes, Maybe. very easily. I got your name. <laughs> and we did. It has seven pillars of a mentally wealthy workplace. They're all in our book. But 
What's the name of your book? Uh, Mental Wealth. Why wealth? Hmm. Has something to do with money? Well, one of the big things that we've been talking about with organizations is that there is actually a direct correlation between the well-being of your workforce and their productivity, their performance, and therefore the wealth of the company. So there's a lot of workplaces that are a little bit hesitant but, but to you're address not, this. Forgive me, you're not saying that if a particular individual is financially challenged, aka poor, that there must be something wrong with their mind. You're not going no, there. Mental, well, mental health doesn't discriminate. You know, rich or poor, everyone can experience this. Mental, well, mental health, health, health is about health. resourcefulness. Yeah. yeah. What we're saying is a mentally wealthy workplace, it's a resourceful space. It's a place where people have the tools to grow, to thrive, and basically are happy to come to work. A workplace where people are happy to come to work, it's a healthy workplace. It's a mentally wealthy workplace. Why? Because they've got the resources, they have the support, and they have the high challenge. For people to be happy, we need a high challenge and high support. So that's what mental wealth is, the high support needed to support that high challenge. And, and that's important because a lot of leaders think that if you start talking about mental health in your workplace, we're going to, everyone's going to take the day off, everyone's going to no. put tools down and it's going to be all this touchy feely soft stuff, which, you know, yes, we want to support people, but you're actually going to get better results. It, it's not showing up on your profit and loss statement right now, just how much is being lost when people are in distress. Hi, I'm Emmy Golding, Director of Psychology for the Workplace Mental Health Institute. We hope you liked the video. If you did, make sure to give it a thumbs up. We have more and more videos being released each week. So when you subscribe, you'll get a notification letting you know when a new one's just been published. So make sure to hit that subscribe button and don't miss out on this vital information for yourself, your colleagues and your loved ones.